one of the things that I realized is that if a Bitcoin at $100 solves one of my problems, it might solve the problems for billions of other people. It has explosive growth, potential for recurring revenue, and network effect. These are the three things that create billion dollar businesses. The reason why I do 30 conferences per year is purely to educate the populations about the new internet being rebuilt in a more fair, you know, just way. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with our awesome sponsors, Megaverse. More about them later. Now, our guest today, Hervé Laren. In 2013, his mum couldn't get money sent to Venezuela where she was based. The only easy solution they come up with was to send Bitcoin. That was 10 years ago. That's how he got interested in the whole crypto space and is now known as the most connected man in Web3. His experience over the last 10 years understanding how crypto, uh, NFTs and Web3 works and put into such a simplified format is really valuable for us all to learn. No matter what you think, no matter what you believe, the truth is that all of this crypto world and all of these digital assets are only going to become more and more and more part of our future. So do me a favor. If you don't believe in it, just listen. If you're skeptical about it, just listen. If you doubt it in any way, please just open your mind and listen because it's changing our lives and the sooner we embrace it, the better we are going to be for it. Cue the music. Megaverse, the digital frontier of tomorrow. Megaverse stands at the cutting edge intersection of technology and imagination. It's a virtual realm where the limitless expanse of the digital universe unfolds, offering users unparalleled experiences and interactions. With its advanced metaverse platform, users can craft unique avatars, forge connections, and even establish their own digital estates. It's more than just virtual reality. Megaverse is an expansive digital civilization teeming with opportunities for both individuals and brands. From immersive concerts to revolutionary retail experiences, Megaverse is redefining the way we engage with the digital world. As we stand on the brink of a new era where the lines between our physical reality and the digital realm blur, Megaverse is poised to lead the charge in this brave new world. Dive in and discover a universe without bounds. This really is the future. Ave, thank you so much for coming to join us on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Right, let's talk all things crypto and understand for the benefit of all of the people that listen and watch this show, we have we have the whole spectrum. We have people that are in it, living it, loving it, okay? And we have people sitting there like your mum, like my mum and dad going, what is this all about? So I think what we need to do is first of all, break it down into three areas and learn about that. And maybe you can take me on your journey of learning about crypto yourself. So the three areas that I think about are the metaverse, okay, NFTs, and crypto. So those are kind of three, three verticals that we've got to consider. But what I'd like to know, first of all, as you're an expert on this, how did you get into it in the first place? How did this crypto world become something that you were exposed to? Well, it, it actually came a, a little bit uh, randomly. And uh, it randomly in the sense that uh, my dad is French, my mother is Venezuelan. So on one side of the family, it was a, a very stable economic environment. You know, France was, was doing great. Um, so, you know, credit cards are working, banks are working, and therefore, you know, you could trust the monetary policy of your country. And on the Venezuelan side, it was chaos. Uh, the Bolivar um, had our rampant inflations. The economy was in shambles. It became one of the most dangerous country in the world. And when you needed to send uh, money from a first world country to a, what became a third world country, although they had the largest um, oil reserve in the world, it became very difficult. So uh, my mother asked my brother and I to uh, to send money to Venezuela. And we, my brother and I were living in, in New York. And the best idea that we had was actually going to the airport, to GFK airport, to go to Caracas, drop the US dollar, and come back the same day. 
up until um, a friend of mine says, well, you should send bitcoins. And, uh, and that's how I went down the rabbit hole. What year was that? So that was in 2013. So 2013, someone says you said, had you heard about Bitcoin or was this completely new? I had heard about it. Uh, most of the information that came out were extremely negative. And, um, and there was a, a very big gap because uh, when I started to learn about it and to call and meet the smartest people that I knew that were in the space, I saw a very big difference between um, the potential of that technology and the, the solution that it can bring to the world versus what was the mainstream media saying. And, uh, and I try to put those two pieces together. Um, I remember um, I, I talked to, um, to, uh, to one of the smartest technologists in the world, and, um, and he said, um, you, know, you know, blockchain is the future. And I says, well, no, this is impossible. You know, people are creating money from nothing. Um, you know, wh why would you uh, even suggest that? He says, well, don't listen to what people are saying. Um, the mainstream media is going to, uh, or, or just the, the population is going to catch up to it. Look at the problem that it, that it solves. And, and he actually introduced me to one of his uh, partners inside of, of his company that he actually had hired originally as, a, as an intern, uh, who's actually the largest owner of Bitcoin in the world. So um, he was on the cover of Forbes as, uh, as, as the largest hurdle. He had given his first Bitcoin to Kim Kardashian and, and Bill Clinton. And I had dinner with him in 2013. And I spent, you know, hours uh, telling him, you know, why this doesn't make sense, basically, um, you know, bringing up all the, you know, the commentaries that I've heard from, from people. And I realized coming out of that dinner that, you know, either everybody is right, who hasn't done the homework, either him who has done his homework uh, is onto something. But one of the things that I realized is that it solved a problem that I had, which is what we call in, in more general terms, the remittance, uh, the remittance business. And it solved my problem. And I thought, if you know a bitcoin at a hundred dollars saves you know solves one of my problems it might solve the problems for billions of other people so um that's kind of how i got into it that's interesting though the problem solving aspect of it so that that for me is always a door opener to an opportunity anyway isn't it i've got a problem now that problem's been solved aha uh -huh. why isn't everybody else doing it this way kind of thing when you think about crypto being around for as long as it's been around now and you think about anything else that's adopted over time. I don't remember anything that's taken 10 years for people to still know nothing about it. You look at the world of crypto, you can take in NFTs, you can take in Web3. It's still a very small percentage of the population in the grand scheme of things that are into it, understand it and use it. The vast majority of the world's population don't yet. But when you think about everything else, 10 years is a considerable amount of time for people to catch on and understand it, whether that be social media, whether that be mobile phones. And, you know, I remember when the first computers came out and we started using computers and how you know, we, we were getting on board with it very quickly. You know, word processors became then, you know, because I had typewriters in my office, electric typewriters that moved on. Why do you think still to this day there is a large percentage of the world's population that either don't want to know, find it too hard to understand, okay, or are fearful of it, even 10 years later? I think it's due when, when you're born. If you're born and the technology doesn't exist, uh, it, becomes, it becomes more complicated to actually uh, start using it. Um, when I see the, the young generation right now who were born with the internet, they understand it very quickly. Um, so you're either forced to learn about it, which is the case for 60 countries whose currency collapse, because that's going to be the difference between having a meal at the end of the day or not, or if you are born in it. If, um, if, you're the, 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 if, if, the, if you see value in your digital identity, then you tend to want to have digital assets. Um, so... Um, so I think that that's that's a reason, and and the other reason as well, it's a little bit like the uh, like the climbing the mountain analogy is that once you start learning about a game, um, 
it is very difficult to go back to the bottom and to learn about something else. So when you start to master, you know, Web 2, which is a lot of case for um, maybe, you know, a certain segment of the populations that's over a certain age, all of a sudden we tell them, hey, now there is Web 3 coming up and that actually is the future. Once you already put your 10,000 hours in into Web 2, it becomes very difficult to come back to come back to zero. Um, and to go down down that process. So um, I think it is growing extremely rapidly, um, but I think also the education process has, has to be there. And uh, um, the reason why I do 30 conferences per year is purely to, to educate the populations about the new internet being rebuilt in a more fair and you know, just way. But if you think about the average person that works that kind of nine to five job, when you when you consider Web 2, Web 2 might not have been in their living room at first, but it was definitely at work. And so it was, it was almost unavoidable, wasn't it? It was like you know, if, if you had a job for a living, you know, even something simple, you know, you're in sales. All of a sudden it, you go from, you know, your little black book and your your card box on one side to someone saying now we've got a CRM system. And it's like, what's the CRM system? Well, you know, you don't get paid your salary and your commission unless you make sure you populate the CRM system. So, all oh, right, so I've got to do it. So the adoption of Web 2 to me seems like pe people had no option but to embrace it, of course, unless they were a rural farmer or something like that. People at the moment don't have to use crypto. We've seen countries try and implement a digital currency in, you know, let's take Nigeria, for example. They brought out the e-Naira, okay, not too long ago, and that was going to replace the Naira. Now, I know quite a bit about Nigeria, third generation of my family to have, have lived and worked in Nigeria. So uh, we know that we've got this currency that goes up and down like a yo-yo and people would rather be paid in dollars than be paid in Naira. So logically, something like the e-Naira makes a lot of sense you know, for a country that has that type of problem. But yet even then, the people of the country were like, mm, no, we'll stick with Bitcoin mm -hmm. by comparison, which, which happened recently. Now, yes, it's still a digital currency, but it's like the lack of faith maybe in stuff like that is what fascinates me. What's your take on that? Yeah, so, so the, the, there's a lot to unpack in there. The, the first one, I would say that, and if we take the US dollar as an example, 98% of the US dollars is digital. So what remains to go digital is the remaining 2%. Um, as far as the trust element is concerned, if today, and I'll take the example of, of Venezuela, if you have the Bolivar and that currency has collapsed, um, therefore the population has a complete mistrust to, towards not only the government, but also the monetary policy of the, of the country. Uh, and if you say the same individuals are saying, well, actually, we're going to do the Bolivar, but now digital, um, you're continuing with the mistrust. Uh, no individual who has been suffering over the last 25 years from that inflation is going to say, oh, well, now we have it digital. Uh, we're going to adopt it because it's the same people, just a different, a different element. So, um, I think that the reason why, uh, especially in your, in your example about, about Nigeria, that, that Bitcoin um, has been the go-to digital currency, uh, or rather the digital asset, um, is that it's decentralized. Nobody controls it. And when nobody controls it, um, you have to rely on, on one thing only, which is mathematics. And I wouldn't be able to tell you what the monetary policy of Nigeria, the US, or France is going to be over the next 10 years. But I know what the monetary policy of Bitcoin is over the next 10 years. Uh, I know how many are in supplies. I know how many will be issued every 10 minutes for the till the year 2140 that we actually mined. Around. So I think that um, there is an element of uh, global mistrust towards towards policies. Now, the difference is is going to the in, is the inflation going to be um, a very small amount? You know, four eight percent. There's even the inflation numbers between what is being published and the reality. When you go to the market, we see very large difference. Um, so I think that 
um, when it relate when it relates to to, to cryptocurrencies, uh, and there's a, over twenty thousands of that, but you know Bitcoin being the the largest one, uh, you have a plan B to opt out of a system that you mistrust. So if you know my uncle in Venezuela uh, would have um, you know take all his money out and put it in. Um, Bitcoin, you know, in 2013, uh, the result would have been very drastic than just, you know, con continuing. And when you look at the, the history of, uh, of, of, of countries and their monetary policies, you realize that the vast majority collapsed. The vast majority of currency collapsed. Actually, the average last span of a currency is 40 years. Um, so there's no doubt that um, the currencies as we know it today are not going to be there, you know, within our lifetime. Um, so the question is, how do you actually uh, diversify your holding, and what's what's your insurance policy for that? Okay, so this is this is the way I see it, and I think it's positioning that's important here. There's a lot of justification and defense behind the reason why Bitcoin and crypto make sense, but I think it's like it's like almost like interest rates in banks. People have their money in the bank and they get paid. Let's say they're getting paid four percent right now. Let's say, and inflation's at eight percent. Their brain is telling them I'm getting 4% and my money's safe. But the reality is they're getting actually a 4% loss if inflation's at 8% because they're guaranteed to lose the value by leaving the money in the bank. And they don't assess that side of things as much. They just go, I'm getting 4%, my money's safe. Rather than going, hold on, what's really happening here? If I take inflation at eight and I'm getting four, then I'm actually making a 4% loss. And I think that, that for me is important to, to consider when we, we have this kind of mistrust around this area. And, and what's most important to consider is in the United States or the UK, wherever that may be, the governments are free to print as much money as they want. They're free to replicate that printing of money on a regular basis. And there's nothing that can stop them doing that. Okay, we have huge amounts of debts in the United States at the moment. Printing money has gone on forever and ever. We know that. But it's like, we, I think we need to use the counter argument way more frequently. We need to sit down, yes, of course, yes, it's new. And yes, it's, it's different. Okay, and you've got to get comfortable with something that's different. But let's have a look at what you've got right now. Let's really understand what you have here, because it ain't that great. Did you know this? Did you know that? Did you know that? Or are you burying your head in the sand and turning a blind eye and just going, yeah, this is all okay because it's all I've known all my life and this new stuff here, well, yeah, you know, I'll, I want to put some cynicism and some negativity into that just because it's easy to because I don't understand it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it, it does. And it's and it's it's very difficult to find what, what are the alternatives and taking the risk also of these alternatives. Once you have, you know, price volatility, once you have... Um, uh, titles of newspapers who one day say one thing, the other day say, says another. I remember when I started in the space, uh, we weren't talking about, you know, where the price is going to be. It was all, you know, is the U.S. government going to knock on your door? Um, not realizing that, you know, the technology behind it was created by the U.S. government, by the NSA. Um, so there was a lot of different reasons why it was you know, consider as a form of self-expression and money is considered as a, so for, uh, as a form of self-expression in the U.S. So the U.S. government wouldn't do, wouldn't ban it uh, per se, but that was a narrative that was there for, for a long time. Then afterwards it was, well, it's used, you know, by terrorists. And then that got debunked mm. very quickly because um, the last thing that a terrorist would do is actually use Bitcoin because all the transactions are traceable. Um, actually, government agencies said in the U.S. we'd rather have criminals using bitcoins because we'll be able to catch them in a few minutes. Mm. Um, so, so I, I think that there's a lot of of, of um, uh, what they call FUD in the um, fear and uncertainty uh, in 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 the market, and and you also have to see, you know, where does that come from? Um, does that come from legacy systems? who are protecting their, their garden and basically are saying, well, we haven't found yet a way to make money with this new asset class. Um, therefore, you know, we're going to protect our current business. And I think that uh, a lot of what's happening is, is that when there's a new technology 
coming into play. They start by ridiculing, make it, you know, very, you know, rid ridiculous as far as, oh, this is, you know, this is, you know, currency made out of thin air after they try to, to ban it. Um, and then finally, they start to join it. And right now we're in the joining phase where, um, you know, the largest asset manager in the world is putting out an ETF to the U.S. government and says, well, actually, we think it's a good technology. And, um, and you know, we're... Um, we will offer it to our clients and we need to have, you know, regulatory approval. So um, I think that's what, that's where we are at uh, uh, right now. And, um, you know, for, for a number of years, you know, there were kind of opposite statements that was made. But I think that now um, there's there's appetite to, to be part of it. And once this happens, um, you know, it will... Uh, it will attract institutional investors. Well, the, the, the average man on the street might not understand this or might not even be aware of this, but when you take an organization like BlackRock, okay, first of all, people need to understand who they are, okay, the scale of the business. And I think recently a report came out saying 88 of the top 100 companies in the United States have got one, uh, uh, the majority shareholders in those companies are one of three organizations, BlackRock, Vanguard, I think State Street's the other one. So these monstrous organizations, these huge asset managers that are, are, are so powerful for them then to say, right, we're going to have an ETF and that's going to be something we're going to do and we're in there means finally, like without a doubt, there is adoption from the very top of this which should give everyone a huge amount of comfort around that and a huge amount of belief. The doubters should be now saying, well, okay, fair enough. Point proven, you know, point now taken. You know, I, I'm probably going to now get, get myself involved and I'm now going to start maybe committing something to that. And if people aren't following that type of news, then that stuff for me needs to be sung from the rooftops. It's like, let's make everyone aware of this because nine times out of 10, most people are what we call momentum investors. Most people want to see somebody else doing it that they can trust first before they'll give it a go. You know, you see these people with the new iPhone with it and they're all queuing up outside. Well, is it any good, you know? And the, the, the iPhone comes out and a few people go, oh, it's burning in my pocket. It's really hot, this iPhone. Ah, oh, see, I told you, I told you. And then the iPhone comes out and it's great and it's fantastic. Well, I better get one now. And I think that's, that, that's what happens a lot with people's behavior, isn't it? It's like, if, if you do it and I trust you, okay, okay, fine, fair enough, then I'll give it a go. With that in mind, let's then, let's then look at the other aspects of the whole world of crypto and see what happened with NFTs. Because NFTs, um, I remember interviewing MetaCobin on the podcast that bought the uh, people's um, uh, digital art. What was it called? Uh, 5,000 days. 5,000 days, that's right. So, and, and I said to him on the podcast, why did you buy it? He said, I had to. He said, it wasn't, it wasn't I wanted to. He said, I had to buy it. It was important. And it was important for the world of digital art. It was important for NFTs. Okay, I had to do it. And I thought that was a really interesting response, you know, from that. Now, I know you were involved in the bidding process. So tell me what happened. So I, I think there was there was um, a couple of interesting elements that 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 came into play. The the first one, um, and the reason why I got involved with it, which I, I think is 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 pretty parallel with with a lot of people who invested early in in the metaverse and and other um, type of digital asset. Um, was that for me, NFT as a, as a technology, um, we think often as NFTs as profile pictures with, with no app value or JPEGs as they, as <laughs> they said, you're trading JPEGs. Um, but the reality for me, what interested me about NFTs and actually digital images was my third types of quote unquote NFTs that I purchased. I got into the non-fungible tokens and the reason why I emphasize is that Non-fungible means one of a kind. And most of the things in the world are one of a kind. Um, when you look at you know, a diamond, a piece of art, it's, it tends to be one of a kind. Um, and what interested me uh, when I participated in the uh, Decentraland ICO in 2017 was that there's 90,000 pieces of land, of digital land that was av available for sale and therefore, you cannot have one more. You cannot create one more. This is based on the algorithm. In that case, it was a DAO. And you couldn't, you couldn't create more. And that digital um, scarcity, I saw that as a huge opportunity. And I says, well, you know, if you want to build something 
um, in the digital world and their scarcity, by definition, is going to go up in value. And at one cent, the price of the ICO, I thought the risk reward ratio was was you know looked looked pretty favorable. And having you know a few years um, of experience in, with Bitcoin at that time, where there's only 21 million tokens, and it went up in value, I thought, well, that's from a fungible standpoint represent what is happening in the real world, which is currency, all $100 bills are the same. And all of a sudden, we're attacking a bigger segment of the market, which is the non-fungibility, the one of a kind. And I thought, well, one of a kind, pieces of land, real estate is the largest store of value of the world. There's digital real estate. Um, therefore, I thought it was a good concept. And ultimately, I see what works in the physical world and use the same mindset in, in the digital world. That's that's kind of was my thought process. So my first purchase was actually a piece of digital land. Then I had to buy my name on the metaverse. So uh, I was lucky enough that being one of the first one, my name was still available for it for it to, to purchase. And then when I helped them start that um, that first you know iteration of the, of the metaverse, they said, well, as a thank you we're gonna give you um, a piece of land, where would you like it? And I actually took the map of London and I looked at what are the most valuable neighborhood and I thought, okay, Mayfair is pretty valuable. Uh, and I look at what type of uh, businesses were on the most valuable street and realized that art galleries were always in the most valuable areas and the most yeah. valuable. So I says, well, I'd like to have art galleries. And they says, well, we'll give you two art galleries because we don't know what to do with it. So here, there's two art galleries. And then once I had my art galleries, I had empty walls and I thought, well, okay, I'm going to need a, a piece a piece of art. And, I, and at that point, Christie's um, knew my involvement with the space, called me and they says, hey, we're going to do that, that Beeple auction. Um, are you interested in participating? And I said, yes, not only because um, I think the first reason I was interested is like the validation of a blue chip company uh, in the art space saying, hey, I want to get into digital. So I felt it was a duty to support the cause and in to encourage. And I almost saw like a, a personal, um, you know, a, 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 you know, it was on my on my kind of like it, it felt something close to my heart to actually help and says, well, now I'm validated. So when, when Christie's called me and they said, hey, we have that that. Um, that piece of art, you know, would you like to be part of it? I said yes, uh, of course. Uh, and I says, well, what's the what's the uh, the, the bid, and uh, or at least the the, the the entry level bid? And they said a hundred dollars. And I says, well, you know, I, I want to be the the first one in the world to put a, a seven digit bid on an, an NFT because I thought that was going to be um, not only valuable for the industry, um, but also. Um, increase the value of my art gallery. So I saw it purely from a real estate standpoint. And I took the business model of the, the Louvre Museum in, in Paris and says, is the Louvre Museum with the Mona Lisa more valuable than without the Mona Lisa? And in some way, that was the Mona Lisa of the, of the, of the digital art world. And obviously, we know the, the lines of people you know, in front of the Mona Lisa um, you know, on an everyday basis. So I said, well, if I actually put that piece of art in my gallery, there's going to be lines uh, in, in front of it. And then, uh, you know, that would be, you know, a, a valuable piece to have. And I did my calculation of how much value would the, the real estate would increase, not only my art galleries, but also the art galleries around and the street around and the neighborhood, uh, the number of people that would be coming in, et cetera. And I came up with a number and I thought that actually seven digit was actually a very, very low number uh, for, for that. I mean, a number where I would have thought, you know, uh, it looks completely absurd for, you know, for people not in the in the space, but it was a number that I felt was a, a value investor number. Um, so and you went in at a million dollars, you eventually, so you didn't go in, you, you eventually got to a million dollars, yeah, in bidding. Yeah, so, so, and I was so confident about it that, that I was actually filmed live on the, on the Crypto Banter TV show and, you know, I was explaining my thought process and, and I didn't tell anybody that the, the, the my bid that I registered with Christie's was a million dollars. So when I went on Crypto Banter, we thought it was going to go for a hundred thousand. So, so we were we were already saying how crazy it was that a piece of digital art would go for a 
hundred thousand. And then the moment that I was live on TV, there's actually my, my reactions when I refresh the page and it says, you are the winning bid at a million. And, and then I realized, okay, this is something way bigger than, than I would expect. And, you know, um, three weeks after it went, it went for 69 million. So I, I went from in the, the spam of three weeks from being, you know, what I consider the highest, where I was the highest bidder, the craziest bid in this, in the space to three weeks after almost look being looked at as like lowballing the actual, the actual auction. But, uh, <laughs> but that created a, a, a bull market for, for the industry and put the word NFT on, on the map. Um, and and you know ultimately just help the entire industry to uh, to get visibility. I've been bidding over the years on a few auctions, and the prices have got a bit steep from time to time. And when when I've won those bids, I've thought to myself, "Did I really want this? Did I really want this?" When 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 you got up to a million, were you thinking it was value for money at a million before you knew it was going to go higher? Or were you thinking, oh, maybe I'll stretch myself here? I, I think it was it was a, a no-brainer. Oh, really? Yeah, I thought I thought it was a no-brainer. Uh, I, I, I thought... I thought it was it was a steal at that price, and and also for the fact that it was the first auctions. I mean, there, there was something. There's something to be said when for years you believe into something, and the whole world is against you, and they says you know that'll never go mainstream. There's there's no future in that Web three category in that crypto category, and then all of a sudden you have one of the prestigious, most prestigious auction house in the world saying, hey, we, we see what, what you guys see. Uh, just from a sentimental value for yeah. me, for me, it was, it was something important. So I get it. I get um, it. I, get, I understand how that must feel. It's kind of like, there's a little bit of like, fuck you, I was right type of thing, isn't there? Yeah, and, and I have that also with uh, with the approval of, of the ETF, which I, I think you know will, will happen so, sooner or later. It's something that we've been waiting for for years. Uh, the adoption of um, the legacy financial system to say, hey, you're not actually you know a bunch of guys in a in a basement doing your things, but but now we actually you know you, you deserve to be on 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 the center stage and to have you know, big names, you know, going behind what you believed for, you know, years, um, I think it's just, it's just validation. So it's a, as crazy as it might sound, it, it's not so much about the dollar figure, but it's, it's about just being right. Mm. Uh, and, and that's kind of feels so much better. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Talk to me. No, this part I want you to talk to me is if I know nothing about it. Okay, I want you to talk to me about the metaverse. And I want you to give the audience a real understanding in simple terms as to what the metaverse is and why it's so important. So for me, I have a little bit of a different explanation of the metaverse. Okay. Um, for me, the metaverse is when the value of your digital assets is more than the value of your physical assets. And the best analogy that I could take is when when you take uh, uh, someone who goes to, um, you know, to the market, um, they will dress however they want to dress in sweatpants and don't really care about the way that they look and who they're going to see on their way there. Um, but when it relates to posting a picture about them on social media, they're going to spend hours on it. They're going to really tweak the captions. They're not going to put the right filters. Because that digital representation of them is much more valuable, will be seen by, and is much more valuable because it will be seen by much more people. Mm -hmm. And and I think that now, the what the metaverse represent is an extreme scalability. And um, I do believe that that there's there's almost two lives. There's the life of people in the real world and the world life of people. Um, in, in the digital world. And for me, the, the metaverse is just your digital representation. Um, and, um, and I believe that that size of that, um, I would say that opportunity, if we look at it from a, from a, from a business standpoint or a, a, a social standpoint, uh, it's much greater than, than what you have in, in the physical world. So you have a lot of people that 
don't think they'd ever be exposed to this digital world. I don't think they'd ever live in this digital world. And I think it's interesting when you hear those people talk and then in the same breath they say that their son's locked in his bedroom all evening Okay, with his headphones on, on Twitch playing Call of Duty or whatever it may be. Because to me, that, that kid that's frustrated them is already living in that world themselves. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, it, it comes. So it, it's funny because when, when kids are on Fridays and they're, they're playing video games, it seems as they're alone in their room. Meanwhile, they're playing with 30 people from all over the world and, and having even probably more um, social interactions than, than ever before. Um, but, but yeah, I, I do think that this is where the world is, is going. So we went from a world of web one, which was read only to web two, which was read and write to now a world of web three, which is read, write and own. So the ownership element now is attached to it. And what the metaverse or the way that we often reduced it by games because gaming is the first narrative, whether it's web two gaming for that matter or, or web three gaming is the capacity to own digital items. And that ownership element, uh, especially in gaming, um, is a fantastic source of, of opportunity for, for people to actually create revenues uh, on, on the metaverse. So um, I, I do believe that there's a, that there's that's where the the world is is going and the next um country uh to be populated is actually in in the cloud <laughs> there'll be people sitting here saying what do you mean heaven <laughs> <laughs> so just elaborate on that um so back back in my parents generation you had to go to uh, different countries to start businesses and was, that's where you had the, the biggest opportunities and and today with communication and and the how easy it is to travel if you want to go to uncharted territory and build something from scratch something that could be extremely valuable in the futures um, you have to go on the cloud you have to go on the metaverse you have to build uh, digital buildings and have you know digital currencies and have digital businesses and have to have you know, uh, the same representations of what you are working in the real life to actually have it in the digital world, which has infinite scalability. And I think that that's going to be the next the next frontier. Um, I've been um, speaking um, over the last few weeks to um, to the team of uh, Deepak Chopra and Deepak oh, yeah. Chopra is um, is um, working on the AI representations of Deepak once, um, you know, uh, you know, in a way to to have him live forever. So, you know, are people going to read his 95 books, spend 20,000 hours re reading it? Or would they rather have the experience of Deepak Chopra of all his life and being able to answer his digital representation and to have a dialogue based on on his knowledge so um i think there's that there's that very famous quote of, of confucius that said every man has two lives and his second life starts when he realizes he only has one and i think that we actually don't even have two lives anymore we have a third life which is when i'm not here anymore uh, what is going to be my digital representation how i'm actually going to live forever and share my knowledge um you know in in the cloud in, in the metaverse and i think that's that's kind of the evolution and i see already people thinking about that you know mm. um, they can leave not only uh books but upload these books and have an interactive dialogue with their physical representation so it's interesting you know I, people say to me if you could choose any guest to come on the podcast who would you choose you know who'd be your dream guest dead or alive and i'm like my dad I was like, why your dad? I'm like, well, my dad's alive, okay? And I would love to spend an hour and a half with him talking and be able to keep that, okay, forever, as he told me, tells me his life story and reminds me of all the things we did when we were kids together, well, when I was a kid. And that, that means a lot to me. Now, that's obviously very analog by comparison, but still, to me, very important. Now, unfortunately, my dad won't cover the podcast, <laughs> so that's not going to happen. But when you think about the Deepak Chopra example, um, 
recently uh, I was asked by the guys from the Megaverse to put my podcast into the Megaverse with them. So like, have the podcast in there. You can have a live audience that can come in. You can do your interview with whoever your guest is and then afterwards allow your audience to do a Q&A with them and they can do 15 minutes Q&A. Your guests will enjoy it. They will enjoy it and, and you'll get more interaction that way. And I was like, that's a really interesting concept. But I had these fears around it's still looking a little bit kind of cartoony, avatar-y rather than what I wanted it to look like. And then I think it was a week ago or two weeks ago, Mark Zuckerberg um, uh, with his AI, with Lex Friedman, yeah? With Lex Friedman. Did you see that? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. That. Uh, where they were hyper realistic images of them, and they were they were doing an interview together, and it was literally almost like it was me and you sitting here as clear as that. Getting to a point where it's that good quality, and making people feel like you're literally in the room with somebody, a la Deep Rack Shop Pro, whoever that may be, that to me is such a game changer, and how that experience is interpreted. It's so much more realistic that people can then really buy into that reality rather than what was going on before with everything being a bit more animated, a bit more computer game-ish. Now, I'm not saying for one minute that applies to everybody because the younger generation, that what's going on at the moment on their games is, is absolutely fine, whether that be FIFA or anything else. But the older generation, the people that are over 35 or 40 years old that are looking at it, going, ah, it's not quite there, those people are going to get this whole new experience very soon, aren't they? Yeah, and, and, and the reality is that it, it's not quite there. And and when we looked at Web 1, who would imagine then 25 years after we will be in the place that we're in right now? So um, uh, I, I've never actually traded cryptocurrencies. What I've been focusing on is, is building within the space. And when I look at the things that are being built right now, um, I think is I think is life changing. Um, Give me some examples. Well, I, I, there there's I would put the example into into different into different brackets. Um, the first one is the user experience that is important. I think the user experience um, is still complicated. Uh, I remember when I was uh, mining Bitcoin, the time that it took to download on an everyday basis uh, your keys. Uh, was taking me an hour a day. Today we can do it in Coinbase in, in a few seconds. Um, and I think that still now it's still very complicated. The fact that you need to hold your private keys, that you need to, you know, to save them in a in a in a, on a ledger. Um, that experience has drastically improved, but it's still very far from um, something as efficient as what is available on on Web two. Um, the other thing is solving real problems. Um, I think that a lot of the times, um, you know, the problems is not being solved. Um, so for me, I was, uh, I got in because it solved problems, but a lot of the times we don't really see a concrete value for the consumer um, itself. And, and I would say the, the third one is, is to have the, uh, the confidence to actually do it. And the confidence could be strictly, do my government give me the tools to actually uh, feel comfortable about getting into the space. Um, so there are a lot of, of blocks within the user experience or just the fact that is this something that I should do or not um, that has to be removed. But I see how, how fast this environment uh, change and how worldwide uh, it, it is um, that I feel very confident uh, about it. And, and even when uh, times are, are very cyclical. Um, I see the confidence of the people in the space re really being there. Um, my dad used to say the, the scariest thing in a storm is the, the fear in the captain's eyes. And when I see the, the captains of our industry and I says, you know, do you feel fearful? They don't. They feel very um, confident. They feel very optimistic about the space and they feel very excited. Um, so, so that's, you know, I feel that this is contagious. Mm -mm. What are you working on at the moment? Tell me something exciting about what you're stuck into right now. So my, my, um, my biggest focus right now is, um, to build on Bitcoin. Um, so 
Bitcoin uh, represents 60% of the market cap within the crypto space. It's the largest liquidity pool. Um, it is uh, potentially uh, an ETF uh, on the verge of being approved as, a, as an ETF. And up until February this year, um, we didn't have the technology to build on the Bitcoin blockchain. So we might have heard words like ordinals and BRC20s. Ordinals are the equivalent of NFTs and Ethereums, and BRC20s are the equivalent of uh, fungible uh, items. And when you look at um, you, when you look at Ethereum, Ethereum is a two hundred billion dollar market cap. Uh, ERC20s, tokens on top of Ethereum, is also two hundred billion dollars. Um, when you look at Bitcoin, it's six hundred billion. The, the ordinals and BRC20s represents a billion dollars. So if we believe that there's going to be tokens, the value creation of tokens built on Ethereum proportionally is going to happen within the number one um, blockchain in the space, Bitcoin, then this should go from a billion dollar to $600 billion market cap, so 600x. So I do believe that uh, the next narrative within the crypto space is going to be Bitcoin, and it's going to come from the fact that now developers have the technology to build on top of Bitcoin. So if today you have a project, are you going to choose the largest liquidity pools, the largest number of wallets, the, the uh, uh, blockchain that has been signed off by the governments by saying, hey, we don't touch Bitcoin, it's a commodity, uh, are you going to build on that or are you going to build on, on other chains? Now, there might be case study for, for, for which chain to choose, but I believe in narrative um, like the metaverse or like real world assets, there is a very strong case to build on Bitcoin and to touch the largest possible group. Um, so right now we're building the large, the, the first ecosystem token on top of Bitcoin, and I'm doing that with Animoca Brands, which is uh, the largest organizations within the Web3 space. We often say that there's two investors in the space, Animoca Brands and everybody else. Um, so I had the chance to, uh, or had the chance at the moment to, to work with them and to develop uh, that, that token, which is for us is gonna be the second token um, that we're gonna launch after ApeCoin, and ApeCoin was the largest token in the space, went for two, from zero to $8 billion, um, in 20 minutes, uh, and also sure. we, we did also the largest um, NFT drop uh, in the space, which is the uh, other side, the metaverse, which is the, the Board Ape Yacht Club um, um, ecosystem. So all these people that are sitting there right now that are holding on to their Board Apes, Women of the Worlds, and all these others that existed around that time, these people that spent a lot of money getting sucked into the hype, what should they do with those assets? Well, so when it relates to art, generally you should have some type of passion behind it. Um, so I, I would say to to adopt a little bit the same the same mindset as you know a physical piece of art. Uh, often people buy it because they enjoy it, and if there's an appreciation of value, um, uh, it's it's you know it's it's a bonus. Uh, but I think on, on a more fundamental um, thought process. Um, they should uh, apply the Warren Buffett principles, which actually is a paradox between Warren Buffett is not in the, the Web3 space or even the Web2 space <coughs> for, that, for that matter, um, which is invest in something that you really understand. Um, and there's a lot of hype in, in the space, which you know today is, is Web3, or today is AI, yesterday was, was Web3, um, but really understand what you're, you're investing in. And I think one of the... Um, to, to relate to the example of, of Bored Ape and, and CryptoPunks, you also buy um, a community. Uh, the reason why there is 10,000 pieces, you have to think about it almost as 10,000 memberships, where you are part of a group that holds you know, professional athletes, Justin Bieber, Madonna, who all, all own their, their Bored Ape, and therefore you're within that, that ecosystem. And the power of communities um, is something that is very um, intrinsic to the to the Web three world. Mm. Uh, the fact that you're all building something something together, and the reason why people don't sell their profile picture or rather replace it where 
where where are, where are board ape take their profile pictures and puts up board ape uh, instead it, because it represents the identity it represents the you know if you know you know type of of uh, of mindset and then you're part of a private group and i think that you know these these uh, these groups being formed within the the internet is uh, is also what creates a, a lot of value of being a part of these groups a world of wisdom ideas and simple a simple explanation about how this world works it's fascinating talking to you today and learning from you really putting it into terms that people can understand and get a real feel for in summary should people buy bitcoin save their money into it over the course of the next five or ten years and use that as an asset class alongside their other investments yes or no uh they should do their homework but you know the fact that the uh the largest asset manager in the space is now putting an application of the etf to the u.s government i think it's a it's a strong it's a strong sign yeah i agree secondly great point you made everyone should understand what they're investing in don't ever invest in something you don't understand yeah, I think it's valuable for 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 Bitcoin and it's valuable for real estate and other asset class. Any other assets, yeah, absolutely. And the future of the metaverse is here to stay. There's already a whole community of people that live and spend their time in that space. It's only going to get better. You can be a momentum investor and you can wait until everybody's taken advantage of it or you can do your research, learn as much as you can now and see what opportunities it can bring for you. Not only as an investor, but also as somebody that might want to grow their business within that space. Yeah, I think I think when you look at, you know, low costs and potential huge upsides, asymmetric return, this is the category where it's where it's at. It has explosive growth, potential for recurring revenue and network effects. And these are the three things that create billion dollar businesses. Uh, thank you so much for coming to join us on the show today. It's been great talking to you. Thank you for having me.